for fun tips and cool information, tune in to HealingTalks.com. All right, so we are at the Woodstock Fruit Festival, and we're here with Tony Wright, who came here from all the way from England. This is Healing Talks, and I'm really looking forward to interviewing you, getting a little bit of knowledge on your perspective on the human evolution to its present state, with all the great crises we have in our civilization, and how you came to develop this unique theory and understanding. Really, I'm just trying to rearrange the pieces of the jigsaw we already have, the sort of modern neurological data, the modern, the modern scientific data, and what I've come up with is something that looks quite coherent, it looks like it makes sense, but it's quite challenging. And it really is, um, looking at our origins, we have Western science tradition, East Africa, we live in the tropical forests, and we had a symbiotic relationship with it, the tropical forests. That's not in dispute, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. What I particularly highlighted is that there's some, some elements in that that are particularly unique, mm -hmm. and their effects on our development have perhaps been overlooked. Right. And I'm particularly talking about what we call fruit. Uh -huh. And of course, fruit isn't just another food source. Fruits a whole developmental environment of its own. It's it's like the equivalent of the mammalian uterus. It's um, it's evolved to generate a whole new generation. It's like a genesis machine. It makes a new generation, and that's done primarily with a unique cocktail of hormones. Okay, and hormones are what read DNA. They they tell the DNA what to build. Um, and including the, the very fine structure, I see. and that in turn relates to function. So, um, based on the accepted data, we formed this relationship that included an increasing, increasingly close relationship with fruit, or as I like to say, this developmental environment, the, the sex organ of the plants. And that's totally unique. Uh, it's never happened in evolutionary history because the flowering plants and fruit are relatively, relatively new. Mm -hmm. They haven't emerged till quite recently. Right. Um, and on top of that, the only place you can get fruit 24/7 for evolutionary time scales is in the equatorial forests. Uh -huh. Not not the non-seasonal forests, not the high latitude forests, because you get seasonal fruit. In the equatorial forests, there's certain niches where there's very little change in in, in weather, uh -huh. and throughout the year it's pretty stable. And that's where you can get fruit all the time. So if you're forming an increasingly entangled symbiotic relationship with fruit, that's where it's going to be. And lo and behold, it fits our physiology very well. You know, our, our capacity for tolerating temperature, our relatively inefficient water systems. Well, it doesn't matter if you're in an environment that's rich in water and, and your diet's rich in water and so on and so on. So, these things are understood. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to highlight the yeah, things yes. that may have been missed, and uh -huh. particularly this hormonally rich environment. The hormones from not just another species, yeah, yeah. but in the way we look at things, a wholly different kingdom. Right. Yeah? Right. And those hormones will still read mammalian DNA. They won't. They won't build leaves. They won't build seed. But they will modify it. And they will change it and, uh -huh. and the, the hormones in fruit they do a whole bunch of things including modifying our own hormones uh -huh. yeah so some mammals for example they the mammalian dna the mammalian genome is is not as complex as plants and it produces a bunch of chemicals like testosterone and estrogen mm -hmm. and they are integral to the developmental environment and to the real-time operating environment uh -huh. And they're very powerful and they build very efficient systems, very efficient survival systems. They've been around forever and they work very well. Uh -huh. However, they don't typically produce extremely large, extremely complex neural systems with the kind of traits we like to think we have. So high cognitive function, a profound sense of compassion and empathy. Uh -huh. um, an ability to be self-aware in a quite unusual way. Those things are incredibly rare. Mm -hmm. It seems as if we have, we still have glimpses of those things, and we have a history that suggests, or a, a mythical account that suggests that those things were much more common at one time. Mm -hmm. So all I've been doing is looking to see, well, if you, if you put that environment back, 
how would a current neural system develop? Mm -hmm. And clearly it would be very radically different from what it is now. Um, it's like we've stripped away all the really unique elements, mm -hmm. and what we're left with now is a basically a primitive mechanism. Our, our own endocrine system is building an increasingly primitive brain. It's kind of reverting back to its original type. Mm -hmm. So my interest is, well, if this symbiotic association was central to our evolution and our, the development of our brain, the functioning of our mm -hmm. brain, mm -hmm. how on earth can we recreate that and prevent this slide into more primitive behavior, yeah. which is echoed in all the ancient traditions? Uh -huh. And the mechanisms are there. They're there in I the see. pharmacology. They're there in, in the developmental biology. Mm -hmm. It all kind of makes sense.